Good afternoon. On behalf of Engineers Australia, I'm delighted to welcome you all to our Thought Leaders series, Innovative Tunnel Design. My name is Amanda and I'll be your host for today. Firstly, in keeping with our custom, Engineers Australia acknowledges the traditional custodians of the country throughout Australia and recognises their continuing connection to land, waters and community. We pay our respects to them and their cultures and to elders past, present and emerging. Before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge that today's webinar is being hosted with Engineers Australia's industry partner, Geofabrics. Geofabrics is Australasia's geosynthesis specialist. They help their clients deliver and maintain infrastructure by minimising risk and increasing value through the innovative use of geosynthetic products. Geofabrics have supported the Australasian infrastructure sector on significant projects from the Victorian level crossing removal to APLNG in Queensland and the Christchurch gondola in New Zealand. On these projects and every project they undertake, they have a singular focus to provide smarter infrastructure solutions. Today, we will hear from two speakers followed by our live audience Q&A and I encourage you to send questions through to our speakers via the chat box. I'd now like to welcome our first speaker, Alina Gavazi. Alina is an Associate Principal and Group Leader within the Arab Victorian practice, as well as leading the Arab tunnelling team in the region. Alina is a Chartered Civil Engineer with 15 years of professional experience in the Australian and UK engineering and construction industries and has worked on several high-profile tunnelling projects, including Melbourne Metro, High Speed 2 and Crossrail, covering roles from design lead to delivery director. Alina has extensive experience in project delivery and has developed excellent technical and engineering knowledge, including critical interface and integration requirements for multidisciplinary projects during her career. Please welcome Alina Gavazi. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, and um, today I'm going to run you through some innovations in tunnel design, um, mainly focused on the um, digital solutions that Arup can offer. So I'm going to run you through the um, Arup Carbon Tool, um, the Asset Portal, and, uh, and the Automated Tunnel Inspection Systems that um, blends in together um, robotics and machine learning. So first of all, the Arup Carbon Tool. So there are many aspects to sustainable development, um, but our action to combat climate change and its impact is our number one priority. Um, Arup has made a commitment being a net zero organization by 2030. Our clients, ranging from private firms to national governments, are increasingly seeking our help to achieve ambitious targets for carbon reduction. So just to give you a refresh, um, embodied carbon is the carbon dioxide emissions associated with materials and construction processes throughout the whole life cycle of a building or infrastructure. And it includes any CO2 created during the manufacture of building materials, such as material extractions, transport to manufacturer, manufacturing, the transport of those materials to the job site and the construction practices used. While the operational carbon refers to the total from all energy sources used to keep our building warm, cool, ventilated, lighted and powered. And that's not just buildings, but the whole of the infrastructure. Typical energy sources for this purpose are electricity and natural gas, with occasional contribution from fuel, oil, propane and wood. So where can we make the most difference in the body carbon footprint is in the planning, design and construction and installation processes. We need to engage our clients and stakeholders early during the design phase to look at carbon footprints and the way of optimization and improvement for our projects. If we look at the source of global emissions by sector, we can quickly realize that approximately 11% of total emissions are due to building materials and construction. That's where we can make a big difference for our projects and clients. As you can see, 49% of those emissions are attributed to the embodied carbon part that we can look at during the concept and the design phase of the project. So now at the um, Arup Carbon Digital Tool, um, which is um, our link to our digital design models, um, the BIM. 
um, for the whole life carbon calculation. We need to have a really good beam model so that we can rapidly quantify and reduce the carbon dioxide equivalent emissions associated with our design. In doing this, we're acting to achieve the United Nations Global Sustainable Development Goals, uh, number 9, 12, 13, and 15, which I um, encourage you to go and have a refresh. The tool enables us to, um, the user to interactively view carbon hotspots in their design in 3D. The visual interactive carbon analysis summary can be shared simply with their colleagues and clients via link, removing the need for printing reports. This has been successfully used um, in the Civil Town project in the UK, um, where AROP is part of the Design JV delivering the project. Um, the scope was to fo focus on early stages, um, especially in extraction of raw materials, product, product manufacturing, transport, and installation on site. We managed to quantify and manage the carbon um, um, emissions during the design phase. So we did a two stages analysis at um, concept and during detailed design, where we could um, highlight opportunities um, to improve the carbon emissions. So the tool is um, extremely, um, extremely helpful and um, it's being used more and more throughout the design stages. Um, it's currently then been um, used also on the transparent and route upgrade in the UK. So what it can do is quantify and manage carbon during the design, and it does require a good BIM model so that we can represent it in 3D. Next um, of other um, innovations that we've used on a previous tunneling project is the asset portal. Um, which was used um, in the um, Crossroad 2 um, feasibility study. So Crossroad 2 um, was, um, uh, unfortunately, it's been cancelled, but it was a study that we did um, for um, Transport for London, um, a new line um, across, um, across London, uh, north to south. So we were rewriting the business case, updating the safeguarding and giving directions to the client. It's a 30-kilometer route and the eight, um, eight meter twin bore tunnels. And it was, got, was going under 30,000 plus building, 100 plus utility and rail assets. So the asset portal was a, a web-based tool that uh, helped us gather and identify potential obstruction to the proposed tunnel route. And uh, um, if, um, if you've designed a tunnel, you understand that that's a um, hugely um, important task and it can be extremely time-consuming. Time and uh, the portal was a central source of truth. Um, both the client and the designer had access to it. And, um, and that's where all the information was stored. The user could view, add, edit, um, and manage the data in one application. So what were its capability? It was a database. It was web-based and interactive. Um, there was automation involved um, because um, we, um, there were scripts behind it that can help generate um, foundation depth, um, help with class detection, um, tunnel alignment assessments, and there was a feature that was automating the drawing production. And there was a user interface. So it was really easy to interrogate and to input information from both designer and the client. So it was a very collaborative tool. And uh, we introduced smart tagging of assets. Um, so all the information was stored. And um, as I said, it was one um, point of truth. So this is what it looked like. This is the interface. It was uh, um, really um, um, intuitive. Um, there were, you could click on any assets and get uh, the information you needed. It was a 3D view of them as well. So you could see both above and below ground. There, um, there was a feature that we could store the geological model. So the, we could automate um, the creation um, of um, ground profile for each of the buildings. Um, and with that, um, the um, building infos based on age and size were calculated, especially for the foundation depth for each of the building across the route. Um, just to remind you, there were 30,000 plus um, building, and that could have been done in a single pass. The class detection uh, with tunnel uh, was automated and automatically um, updated every alignment change. And you know that when you're in feasibility study, the alignment changes many times try and find the optimal route. Um, I think that was done 20 plus time at least. Um, and you can, you know, if you've done that with um, um, basically um, 
hand method, um, it's, uh, it's very time consuming for the engineers. So this is just showing you the automatic clash detection. Um, obviously, it was looking at um, a, a radius um, around the tunnel. And uh, whenever a um, building foundation was encroaching the radius, that was going to be um, highlighted um, within the portal and the report created. And that was done every time the alignment changed. A big part of the um, work the, the engineers are doing um, and is producing is the classical plan and profile drawings. Um, at the time, um, the client still required um, sort of drawings in the old format and not a 3D model. Um, and all these drawings were automated. Um, it's, um, it's a massive help um, in, the, in the design um, of the early stages of a big infrastructure, linear infrastructure project. Um, and it's a fundamental document um, for the client. So as a summary, um, it's, um, this tool makes it really, it's really easy to access, um, usable by the engineer, for input information and by the client and potentially other stakeholders. It's really easy to access. Um, it's a Google Maps style um, and shows you above and below ground. And it's got smart tagging of assets. So if you click on an asset, you'll be able to get all the information. So it already achieves automatic production of drawings and the long-term storage of information. What it can become, um, we can think about combining damage assessment um, for the buildings, um, the monitoring um, during, before and during construction, and also um, access um, can give access to stakeholders here if wanted, so that we can have one platform for communication. And then obviously there is the machine learning part. For example, a search engine that using photos and maps um, can determine if a building has power or not. It's a huge help um, and um, bringing efficiency during uh, efficiency during tunnel design. The next topic um, that I just want to run you through is um, the work we've done um, uh, around tunnel inspections and how, um, using robotics, we have managed to automate the process and scale it up for our clients. So 40% um, of construction's output is spent on repair and maintenance in the UK. So repair and maintenance um, is a huge factor on, um, on spend. And just we just look at tunnels that's about uh, around 100 million. And uh, inspection is a key component when you go, have to go and repair and maintain an asset. And originally, it's, um, it was done manually, um, which is um, very time consuming, or um, had a really high cost um, using specific hardware for surveying. So our focus on um, lowering the cost for this, um, for this activity, um, and also um, bring in efficiency through machine learning and um, advanced softwares. So why did we look into this? First of all, the um, old method of uh, carrying out uh, the inspections was very subjective. Um, it depends on the person that goes down the tunnel, and uh, very labor intensive, having to survey um, kilometers and kilometers of tunnel um, normally at night, um, when um, you know, depending what the asset is used for, or with really difficult um, access requirements, and then it became therefore really uh, expensive um, and infrequent because we couldn't, we can't do it all the time. So we're looking at addressing these three items, uh, trying to make the um, inspections consistent and uh, repeatable, um, taking away the labor-intensive asset by automating it. And then bring in a cost effective solution and increasing the um, the frequency of inspections and where are inspections required so they're required for operation and maintenance of the assets, but also for asset protections. Um, imagine building a um, metro project underground in busy cities. Um, we need to know the status um, of the assets that are around the new tunnels, so the inspections are used for asset protections and identify um, external stakeholder assets that need um, protecting. And also during construction and handover. 
So what we, we looked at building was a um, toolbox technology um, featuring um, hardware data capture and a suite of deliverables. And that can be personalized based on the client needs, basically. And that is, um, we, we tested it on, uh, on projects and it did bring real innovation and uh, great collaboration between clients and, um, and us. So if we look at the hardware that can be used on uh, such a projects, we can go from very expensive high tech hardware to very low cost, depending on the specification required. And then the data capture. There are different ways of doing it. This can still be done um, manual um, in the normal way that's been done so far or automated. And we trialed the automated piece with various um, pieces of equipment um, throughout the years, uh, for starting from CERN, where there was this uh, little robot going around the tunnel, um, to um, trains or on, on rails or cameras mounting on I-beams at the crown of the tunnel. And then the deliverables, depending on client needs. This can be personalized, but the key is that um, they are repeatable and um, the quality and standard are the same each time that the um, inspection takes place. This can be represented on portals and they are in digital format. So this is, for example, a point cloud. Um, output um, of the tunnel that creating a 3D model that can be stored and compared at each of the inspections that are undertaken. And this is the collaboration we had and how we've, um, we've delivered it to give real innovation. We developed this with uh, CERN and National Grid initially, um, and it's recently been rolled out to a current project in the UK. So what are the client needs? So short, short term, we're looking at short term with support with conventional um, and general talent inspections. So our solution is to, um, we can still do the manual inspection, but we can pair it with the smart technology to help the people um, that are carrying out those tasks. For the medium term, um, we can look at doing remote inspection. And basically, these are preventative maintenance requirements, basically, looking at a more proactive way of undertaking inspection. And for long term, this can be used for technical assessment um, and cross-network um, line material degradation assessments to support the residual life risk of tunnels and to inform future maintenance requirements intervention, planning, and budgets. We have collaborated with a series um, of entities, um, such as university, in particular the University College of London and Cambridge, and uh, manufacturers such as Toshiba, to improve our capabilities and develop a technology that can help our clients. And this has led to the development of our in-house um, defect detection and machine learning capabilities. We have developed a tool that can um, help detect defects in tunnels um, automatically. And this is a huge advance um, to allow repeatability and automation of tunnel inspections. For example, um, a regime of automatic inspection has recently been used on the Anglo-American project in the UK, which is actually one of the longest UK tunnels uh, being built. It's about 35 kilometers long, and um, its purpose is to tr um, tr transport polyhalide um, from the mine to the point of transport. So the technology we used comprised a series of um, 3D videos and infrared cameras LiDAR and acoustic sensors, and a self-powered hardware with um, IoT technology. We trained machine learning modules to detect defects in tunnels, such as water ingress, and to classify the assets within the tunnels, 
such as cables and brackets. The whole technology was cloud-based and that allowed for a continued data stream and continuous backup. This proved the viability of the system and it was a step change compared to manual processes. It was incredible how we could compare different um, inspection um, times um, and repeat it with the same quality. And I hope this is going to be used for future tunnel projects and uh, um, for asset management of current infrastructure projects. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alina, for a great presentation. I'd now like to welcome our second speaker, Rajesh Bavsa. Rajesh leads a team of business development infrastructure sector for Geofabrics Australia. Rajesh received his civil engineering degree in India and has 29 years of design and construction experience with more than 14 years in sales and technical marketing of geosynthetic materials in Australia. Rajesh joined Geofabrics in early 2007. During this time, he has been extensively involved in assisting geotechnical consultancies throughout Australia by offering preliminary evaluations on roads, rail, vertical structures, high embankments, ports and airports using different geosynthetic products. Please welcome Rajesh Bavsa. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first of all, Amanda, thanks for uh, a great introduction and also thanks to Alina for providing a great insight in the tunneling designs uh, in Australia. My name is Rajesh Bavsar. I'm working as a National Business Development Manager of Infrastructure Portfolio. And today's my presentation is purely focusing on utilizing geosynthetic materials in a tunnel design. So I'm going to take you of a geosynthetic journey into the tunnel applications. So my presentation outline covers who we are as a geofabrics, why to choose geofabrics on your projects, some recent projects we have been involved, supplying geosynthetic materials, technical services offered by geofabrics, applications, and summary. So first of all, who we are. So we are the local manufacturers of geosynthetic materials here in Australia. We have two factories. One is in Albury, New South Wales, and second one is in Ormia, Queensland. Geofabrics employs nearly 150 people throughout Australia. We have 12 branches, as well as we support nearly 100, sorry, I should say 1,000 Australian suppliers, many located in regional New South Wales or, and Australia. We also have a NATA accredited manufacturing laboratory, a link to our manufacturing facilities. As, as a geofabrics group, we have a similar operation in New Zealand. So we have a two head offices. One is in Brayside, Victoria, and second one is in New Zealand. At the same time, we have a national fruit, footprint as well as branch network. Now, why choose your fabrics? Uh, that's the main questions you always have. So over the 40 years, and when I said 40 years, Geofabrics was established in 1978. So nearly over the 40 years, uh, Geofabrics is a leading branch in geosynthetic solutions uh, offering throughout Australia, New Zealand, and Pacific Islands. Uh, we also have a leading other suppliers or other manufacturers throughout Australia or uh, throughout the world partnering with Geofabrics, uh, offering a quality products. Now, what we do, we work with you to understand your project requirements. The first of all, you bring your problems. We will, we will try to find out the solutions for you. Second thing is it's about working together. So when we consider working together, we offer the support to our customers from conception to completions throughout uh, the project, including uh, evaluation services, installations uh, by qualified civil engineers. At the same time, we also offer a great technical support through our GRID, which is a geosynthetic research innovations and development laboratory. Uh, we also recently uh, implemented some uh, circular economies and sustainability in our manufacturing process. So by, offer, uh, by selecting geofabrics, we offer you a green range of the product solutions that help to reduce the waste to the landfill by using recycled plastic materials in our manufacturing process. So 
how Geofabrics was developed up to this particular point. So first of all, in 1978, Geofabrics was established here in Australia. In 1987, first roll of the bidding was launched. In 2018, uh, we actually, uh, we were successful in winning the award for the International Exporter of the Year. In 2020, we soft launched our uh, bidding green range of the products here in Australia by utilizing locally sourced recycled polymers. And in the same year, we were actually, uh, you know, we were in top 10 of companies. We were top 10 companies in AFR's review for the most innovative companies in Australia. In 2021, actually we won the award uh, by introducing the Sopsil, which is, purely focusing on the PFAS contamination problems. And then we also launched a Geofabrics Academy in 2021, and we also acquired Plasco. Now in 2022 till date, we can proudly say that Geofabrics actually saved 20 million plus bottles going into the landfill by reutilizing in our manufacturing process. So what the, what is the green for with our sustainable solutions? We are committed to the uh, living the positive footprint on the planet. We have a singular focus to protect, contain, and secure the physical environment by using sustainable geosynthetic products and solutions. Now, we are first to the market to make green range of the products using Australian source recycled plastic materials in partnership with VZ by choosing the use of Bedim Green, Tractex Green, Silmac Green, or Megaflow Green, you are helping to reduce the waste from Australian landfill, which supports a circular economy. Uh, with, the, with Australia creating nearly 74 million tons of the waste each year and 130,000 tons of plastic ending up in our waterways and oceans, it's more important than ever to choose our sustainable solutions for your product projects. Now, just would give you some understanding or ideas where we involved recently. So this is our recent project list, Cross River Rail in Queensland, Rosal Interchange Waste Connects in New South Wales, North Connects in New South Wales, Metro Tunnels and Westgate Tunnel in Victoria. So we have a current projects going or running with our geosynthetic materials. Now in terms of tunnel solutions, Geofabrics offers a wide range of the products and solutions in tunneling applications. As you can see, it starts with the protection and cushioning. We also offer waterproofing membrane solutions or products. We also have a aspected drainage sheet in our portfolio for the wall applications. We also offer a lining systems. We have a product called Megaflow as for a subsoil drain or under drain in these particular tunneling applications. We also have a cuspated sheet for the floor applications as well as payment stabilization applications in tunneling. Now, in terms of product groups or range, as you can see, it covers the drainage, waterproofing, and protection and support. First of all, drainage, Megaflow Green panel flow are actually made here in Australia by Geofabrics utilizing recycled HDPE materials. We also offer a wide range of strip drain, Geonet coat drain, Geonet, as well as wall cuspated sheet. For waterproofing side of the applications, uh, we offer geosynthetic clay liner made in our SQM factory or Queenstown factory. We also have a geocomposite material called uh, Enduracil, which is a membrane. It's a light or 250 or 500 micron HDP membrane sandwiched between two layers of bedroom geotextile. We also offer PVC lining as well as HDP linings. We also have a capacity of laminating different types of the product, which includes membrane plus geotextile or membrane plus geotextile plus geograde. We also have a bituminous uh, geomembrane in our portfolio, as well as PyTech tab. Particular for the protection and support, we offer a wide range of the products and solutions, including Tensar, GeoGrid, GeoWeb 3 Dimensional Cellular Confinement System, Tencate RSI, which is a very innovative geotextile invented by Tencate, ERG and glass grid for asphalt reinforcement, marker layer, fire retardant geotextile, and floor cuspidate sheets. Now, as you can see from this particular cross section and photos, for under drainage, we offer Megaflow Green, which is made here in Australia. And I can probably say that it's 100% recycled material and it have a very high flow capacity and drains water 60% faster than 100 millimeter round pipe. So it's a very efficient drainage system. We 
we have here in Australia. At the same time, for the wall drainage, we offer different types of strip drain and cascaded sheet offers. Now, let me show you some nice photos of some other recent projects. As you can see, uh, this is actually one of the projects uh, in New South Wales where we offer our drainage system. And you can see, because of the flexibility in our material or products, it can adhere to any subgrade conditions and it can, it can be installed very easily without any hiccups or without requiring any major uh, specific or special um, machineries. Now, in terms of wider range, particularly with uh, 900 millimeter or more, you can see we have a geo sheet, which is a single side cuspated geocomposite drainage sheet. We have also have a cold drain, which is double side cuspated geocomposite drainage sheet. Depending on the site conditions, you can utilize one of them. We also offer GeoNet, which is a composite geo drainage systems. And it also have, uh, we also have a capability of laminating geotextile one side or both the sides or offering a, uh, only a GeoNet products. We also have, have a wide range of the cuspated sheet in our portfolio, and which particular with these particular systems, drainage systems, you can see it's actually designed to collect the, and drain the large volume of the unwanted surface and groundwater from the roads and rail tunnels. Now, this is a very recent project here in Australia where we innovated our mega flow to the panel flow to meet certain requirements of the clients. And you can see from these particular photos that it was installed very easily without any major hiccups. At the same time, you can see it also runs the flushing hose through these particular pipes uh, to, to keep it uh, uh, clean for, for the longer life. Now, this particular product actually, is, as you can see, it's also adhered to the surface very easily. And we actually modified the, the material or our manufacturing process in such a way that it can be uh, used with different types of uh, nail guns. So that's also our commitment to the local uh, contractors uh, that we can offer you uh, innovative solutions and we can work with you to find out a solutions for your project. This is another project where we supplied this particular wider products. As you can see, the flexibility is paramount here and you can see it's also very easily installed. And you know, it's also have a flushing hose running through this particular product. Now, from drainage to waterproofing, as you can see, we have a wide range of the products, particularly with the geosynthetic clay liners. This material is actually made here in Australia through our, geo, uh, through our Queensland factory. We also have a uh, lining systems available. Uh, in, on one of the recent innovative ideas, we actually created a samples of uh, geocomposite uh, made up of membrane, geotextile, and geogrades. We also have offers BNC, which is a conductive geotextile, uh, utilizing the property of graphene to, to actually can undertake the liner integrity surveys without any hiccups. And it also provides reliable leak detection of the liner pin holes down to one millimeter in diameter. Uh, and we also offer the endudacil, which is a geocomposite liner combined with two layers of bidding geotextile. Now, protection support, uh, particular, we have a different solutions here for your ground stabilization applications covering from uh, tensile geogrades, three-dimensional cellular confinement system, for asphalt reinforcement, we have a different products as well as some different geosynthetic materials. Now, what I would like to show you is this is one of the projects for underground mining applications. Uh, the major issue was the tunnel clearance, and they need a very thin layers of pavement with the geosynthetic materials to support extra heavy loads running over the top. And we come up with a solution using a one layer of beam geotextile as a separator, placing a three-dimensional cellular confinement system geoweb on the top and uh, using this uh, spoils uh, actually readily available in that particular mining and uh, they achieved a very good support, uh, load support, I should say, on this particular surface. Now, I might go in detail for a couple of applications only. 
uh, not everywhere, but first of all is definitely drainage. And uh, it's one of the most important applications of geosynthetic materials in the tunneling system. So if you can see the tunnel, so main thing is tunnels are large drainage systems. As we know is that once we excavate any hole, it will stay away disturbs the hydrostate hydraulic equilibrium. And as we, and we know that water always flow from the high to low potential. So we, as soon as a tunnel dig, we need to make sure that it have a very good quality drainage system available to capture all the excessive waters. Now, tunnel can be sealed, which is undrained, or drain, depending on your requirements, depending on the site conditions, and depending on actually applications. When we consider undrained, generally it's a hydraulic or water tunnels. For drain tunnels, it could be road and rail or transportation tunnels. Now, particularly with the undrained tunnels, it required in areas where the groundwater does not want to be disturbed, I in I in the cities and lowering the, of the ground level water table results in a settlement. So in this particular case, waterproofing layer and concrete line needs to be with, to withstand the hydro, hydrostatic pressure. While drain tunnels can have thinner walls, which is less excavations, and hydrostatic pressure is related by the drainage system. Now, the similar things also apply for the invert, which is at the floor. So if you consider a conventional design for the floor drainage, generally the drainage collection system can be typically 300 millimeter aggregate layer with a slotted drainage pipe, as you can see on the cross sections. And this pipe trench is also additional contribution or construction process. Now, if you consider this whole scenario, it required a larger tunnel cross sections because we are adding 300 millimeter of the drainage layer at the base. So it required larger cross sections. Now, this 300 millimeter of drainage layer can very easily be replaced with high capacity 40 millimeter cuspated HDP drainage sheet. It also have a very high crossing strength. It speed up the construction very, very well. It can be installed with other geosynthetic layers of the systems without any problem. It also reduced the invert depth of the drainage, as you can see from 300 millimeter of rock to 40 millimeter of profile. And because it's made out of HDP material, it can also be served as a secondary waterproofing layer in this particular application. And the beauty is the concrete slab can be cast into the cut and uh, this strand transferring the loads to the base where it without any agitations, without any hiccups. Now, I'm just giving some more cross sections and ideas. So you can see, particularly with these cuspated sheets, it's a ribbed conical profiles for high strength. And it's actually used, as you can see, it creates a bit of arching effect and providing a larger load capacity. Now, this curve profile can be, uh, can be used or can reduce the flow turbulence, which is the most important criteria for uh, the inward drainage, as well as this void can be filled with a concrete screed without any problems. Now, very typical cross sections, as you can see from in about drainage details, you will see this particular uh, in the majority of the underground tunnels where it have a, like a particular protective screed placed over the layer of geotextile and that geotextile is acting, acting as a cushioning layer. Then you have a waterproofing membrane, which is your primary one. Then you have a cuspated sheet uh, infilled with the concrete. You have a geotextile separator and then you have a particular prepelled subgrade. And this is a typical cross sections of majority of the drainage floors. Now, at the same time, if you see this drainage on the side of the roof, you can see there, there is a also a requirement of, this is actually also have a waterproof membrane, but in this particular case, they are using GeoNet for the 100% coverage. Now, I would like to introduce our GRID, which is Geosynthetic Research, Innovation and Development. And this is actually laboratory purely focusing on research and development. So it's not a testing laboratory, it's actually research and development laboratory. And in this particular laboratory, we can provide a very good technical support. So first of all, on your left side, you can see uh, there is a transmittivity machine, which is actually, create, uh, which is actually uh, creating lots of flow capacity testing. What we can do here, 
we can actually model hydrostatic load as well as we can replicate the boundaries. And when I said replicate the boundary, it means whatever your subgrade condition is, we can replicate that one into our laboratories. We can carry out the testing under different load conditions on the geosynthetic materials you want to you, you would like to utilize. And we can actually, depending on the different hydraulic gradient, we can also define the flow capacity of that particular product or geosynthetic materials. The second one is actually mechanical analysis. And when I consider mechanical analysis is we can actually measure the crushing strength or compression strength of any geosynthetic material under high load. At the same time, we also have a capability of carrying out the seam strength testing on a different geomembrane. Now, and third one is actually carrying out the testing for the durability. And in majority of the cases, durability is actually linked to the groundwater chemistry. And as you know, there is a very major concerns if your this groundwater have a high or low pH, and you need to make sure the appropriate geosynthetic material should be selected according to this particular um, water chemistry. We also have a capabilities of defining the design life of these geosynthetic materials by carrying out the testing, like oxidation, oxidations, as well as susceptibility of the hydrolysis. So this is our actually uh, research and development uh, laboratory uh, based in Gold Coast, and it's it, it, we can we can actually utilize them on any of the projects you have. Now, just a cuspid range of the products we have, which starts from six millimeter to 40 millimeter. They also have a high to low crushing strength, but we can provide you this technical support very easily. You can see some tensile capacity as well as flow rate at different gradient at 20 kPa crushing strength or vertical strength pressure. Now, just give you a very quick aspected range flow rate capacity at 20 kPa, depending on different thickness, you can see a different gradient, what would be the flow depth is but we can provide you further assistance on this one too. Now, what we have done is we actually modified some of the things in terms of drainage applications. So you can see from these applications or from photos on the top, it's a cuspid sheet with the flow, or particular with the hose in the system for the flushing. But at the same time, if you see, there is a mega flow panel drain also have a flushing hose going through this particular panel drain. So we can come up with a solution for the client, depending on your requirement. And this all actually modified here in Australia uh, through our uh, Albury factory, as well as some other partners. Now, just give you a brief background on the lining systems. Uh, as you can see from this particular cross section, there are two types of the lining systems. Uh, one is purely for the moisture barrier, where you can utilize the membrane with the, with the geotextile as a cushioning layer but at the same time the second one is actually a water pressure line where your geo membrane is not only moisture barrier but it's also designed for the water water pressure or hydraulic pressure there now particularly with the waterproof linings there are different types of geo membrane utilized as a waterproof uh, system which include pvc lldp and vldp which is LLDP is liner low density polyethylene. VLDP is very low density polyethylene. Now, in in majority of the cases, minimum criteria to consider or selecting these particular products being pervious over the design life of nearly 100 years. It, it also have a capability of exposure to tensile strength due both during the placement and in service. It must be chemical resistance from the various sources as we know. It will be a natural origin or it will be a concrete leach or grouts. It must be biologically resistant. It also should be quickly and easily available so that uh, it minimizes the time of installations. And it's also allow, and it should allow seams to be checked for the water tightness. It must be repairable for the maintenance purposes and have a high level of fire resistance and low fire emissions. Now, this is just nearly finishing my presentation here. Just I would like to highlight a couple of things, which is technical services offered by Geofabrics and the summary. So first of all, I would like to highlight technical uh, product and technical services. So our Geofabrics employees are actually trained to provide uh, installation support for any geosynthetic materials on your project. 
as well as as i explained it to you for particular with our greed which is uh, covering our technical and laboratory teams our industry experts providing excellent support to the designers and contractors by carrying out lots of r and d's uh, through our uh, laboratories we can also offer the solution and technical support our particularly testing and evaluations on tunnel drainage and reinforcement products as i explained it to you previously we also offer a laboratory testing at our geosynthetic testing services uh, we offer construction advice and optimization services to our customers we also offer on-site service to, to particular professional installation and testing uh, so it's actually our view is offering the support across the entire project phase from conception to completion at the same time we are very proud to offer a quality manufacturing or quality products uh, which is made here in australia like bidding green and megaflow green which meets our public specifications and are also traceable from the manufacturing system through raw material through the finished product so that's our commitment to the G, to the australian in the, uh, to the australian con, uh, construction industries or infrastructure entities that we have this particular traceability of each and every products we supplied here in Australia. Now, just this is my last slide, putting some summary together for my today's presentation. As you can see, proven solutions are available with uh, geosynthetic materials to be used in particular tunneling application, which includes lining, floor support, and drainage systems. It, it, it is also a cost-effective solution and it's a proven solutions with number of cases here uh, where you can see like generally when we consider cost effective like reducing from a 300 millimeter drainage layer to 40 millimeter of cuspated sheet as we know the excavation of the tunnel is very costly by just reducing that 300 millimeter drainage layer to 40 millimeter cuspated sheet will actually offer you a very good cost saving we also offer local research facilities through our grid as I explained it to you. And that particular facility is available for all the clients here in Australia, as well as in the other part of the world. Uh, we heavily focus on the R&Ds. So it's not a testing laboratories, it's a research facilities. Uh, we also offer a sustainable products made here in Australia, like Bidim Green, Megaflow Green, Panel Flow Green. And we, we work with our customer to come up with a, a solutions for their projects and everything. And we also have a number of local proven case studies as well as projects throughout Australia. Um, this is my last slide. Uh, thanks, for, thanks for having me. Thanks for listening. Uh, handing over back to uh, Amanda for Q&A. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you to Rajesh and Alina for your insightful presentations. This afternoon, we focus on innovative tunnel design, um, which, as we know, with the demand that's going on, it's certainly very topical across Australia and for the engineering community. It's now your turn to get involved. Could you please ask our speakers questions through the chat box? And if you can, who your question is directed to. I also want to say thank you to everybody who submitted a question whilst registering for today's um, webinar. And we might start with you, Rajesh. Uh, we've had a question that's come in from Mohammed in New South Wales. It's quite a big question. And Mohammed's asking you, what is the durability of the geosynthetic products in tunnels? Thanks. Uh, thanks, Mohammed. Uh, it's a very good question uh, because when you consider geosynthetic materials, we need to look into what polymers has been used in manufacturing that material. So in majority of the cases, uh, the products I have presented here are made out of either high density polyethylene or polypropylene, where it having a very high resistance to any chemical degradations or hydrolysis. And that's the most important criteria, selecting the right geosynthetic materials for your applications. Uh, having said, as I presented, uh, geofabrics also have a capability of carrying out actually taste on the geosynthetic materials with a site-specific leachate or any chemical compositions of hard that water may have we can carry out the testing in our grid laboratory to make sure that 
it meets your long-term design and durability requirements. Um, you can contact us anytime and we can we can provide you that further assistance on any project you may have. Thanks. Thank you, Rajesh. Um, and moving on to design, Elena, um, at Engineers Australia, we have lots and lots of events and webinars that we talk about BIM. And um, we've had a great question coming from Rajendra, who is also in New South Wales, asking you, Elena, is BIM used in tunnel design and construction? And if so, to what level of complexity, i.e. structural only, or including the electrical and mechanical elements? Elena. Thank you. Um, so yes, BIM is used in tunneling projects, uh, and uh, depending on the on the project specification, um, can be used for with different levels of complexity. Um, the project I am currently working on encompasses structural and IMEP, um, and is used for full flash detections um, during design. But I would just encourage um, the use of a more broader word, not just BIM, but we're now talking a, a digital model, and that's what we need to try and focus and adopt in the future tunneling projects or infrastructure project so that we can maximize um, the potential of uh, our digital solution. Um, and we get to influence the project specification from the um, onset of the project um, so that this digital solution can be adopted throughout the life cycle. Um, we can, uh, via the digital model, um, we can work in a digital environment and we can bring together BIM, JS program uh, during the um, design and delivery phase um, up to then the asset management phase. So we really need to try and push um, the industries, our clients, um, to be flexible um, and adopt more digital solutions. Thank you, Elena. Do you want to comment on that at all, Rajesh, from a, from your perspective, um, from a construction? Uh, uh, no, I think so. Elena already covered a nice response. I should say that, so thanks. Fabulous, fabulous. So Rajesh, staying with you, a uh, question again from New South Wales from uh, Marco, uh, talking about performance and durability. Um, can these geosynthetics be used on existing pipes and tunnels to improve their performance and durability? Great question, Marco. Rajesh? Yes. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Marco. Um, in a nutshell, I should say yes, it is possible to use these geosynthetic materials in the existing uh, tunneling uh, projects or anything you may have. The beauty of this product is it comes in a flexible, it comes in a role, so like it's very easy to handle these project products on any of your current site conditions or any of the current projects or current live projects, I should say. Only trick part is how you're going to install that one. And that's that's at that particular point, you need a specialized contractor to make it possible. But in a simple way, yes, this product can be used for getting a long longevity or durability of that existing structure in tunneling applications. Thank you, Rajesh. Um, moving up to Queensland, um, we've had a great question from Nicholas. Good afternoon to you. Um, talking about Elon Musk, asking, will the innovation claimed by Elon Musk's The Boring Company is likely to change tunnelling in the future? Elena. Um, I hope so. <laughs> I mean, you've got to admire Elon Musk. Um, he's got full of ideas and he's um, willing to invest to prove that they work. Um, so he's investing heavily um, to prove and trial new tunneling technology. And uh, I have to say, Arup has been working with the, um, the, it's called the Boring Company um, for the past three years um, to help um, his company understand um, opportunities coming from Hyperloop and how that can change um, the future of transportation system. So yes, we, we are supporting and um, I'm really hoping that it will become true at some point um, because it, it does have the potential to completely change the way um, we use and move 
um, about in our cities, but also across cities, across countries. Um, obviously, there are obstacles, and uh, we've been working with him throughout the journey um, to understand what needs to be overcome, and also the technology. How is that going to work? Um, so it's it's a work in progress, um, but let's see. Only future will tell. Thanks, Elena. Um, Rajesh, you mentioned in your closing remarks about um, research and development is very um, important to uh, Geofabrics and the work that you do. Um, and we also talked about sustainability and touched on climate change. With the extreme weather conditions we've seen in Australia and on the topic of innovative tunnel design, does this, has this impacted on any of work you're doing or likely to do? Wow, I mean that's a, <laughs> that's a great one. Uh, what we are what we are seeing, particular with uh, local government as like a federal as well as state government, they are actually pushing all the local manufacturers for circular economy, sustainable products to be used or manufactured. At the same time, it should be a cost effective. So what Geofabrics implemented here is uh, we are sourcing the, the polymer or recycled polymer locally from with the help of VZ. Uh, we are putting this one in our manufacturing process, but to make sure that it's not going to compromise with the quality and longevity of the products here uh, or applications here in Australia. And our laboratories we have a two laboratories one is actually not accredited laboratories laboratory purely for the testing service but at the same time our grid is uh, purely on r d both both labs are working collaboratively to make sure that these products are sustainable as well as offering the longevity in this type of applications now particularly with the climate change absolutely you can see there are lots of floods lots of uh, damage occurs, lots of slip failures occurring throughout Australia at the same time, and geosynthetic solutions are available for this each and every failure mode of, of the roads or for the slopes and walls or any other applications you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Rajesh. Um, Alaina, do you want to comment on that either from the work you're doing now or what you've done in the past? as far as the impact of um, uh, climate change in the work you do? Yeah, so as, as I said, we need to um, look at the answer of the project. That's where we can find ways of optimizing the carbon foot footprint on our project by selecting um, technologies, materials that help reduce um reduce it and um it's it's from a design perspective um it's it's a concept um and detailed design that we really need to push um for commitment from our clients and we can help them guide their decisions thank you thank you elena and rajesh um staying with you elena we've had a question coming from giovanni in new south wales good afternoon to you asking you elena your thoughts on current barriers to innovation in australia broad question um very broad question and uh, i think that as the as an industry um we can definitely help um new project major infrastructure projects um adopting new innovation uh, by making sure that there is that focus at, um, at the onset of the project the planning stage uh, where we can have a full review and challenge um, the way projects are done or the business as usual work um, and see a way we can improve and um, where we can change. Um, I have to say contract models are also a big factor in promoting and allowing innovation um, to be adopted and developed throughout the project. Um, so we need to make sure that as an industry, we are there to influence um, everyone to be flexible and open-minded um, so that we we remove those constraints, which I know some cost program from a program perspective, um, so that we can push and allow new technologies to be implemented and considered um, so they can make a positive change um, in the projects to come. Thanks, Elena. And Rajesh, what do you see are the current barriers to innovation in Australia? Um, 
or patients, we are using a lot. We a good questions uh, actually. Uh, actually, we are using instead of barriers, we are using this one as an opportunity. So, give you one of the best examples in terms of some of the innovative products we have come up with, like a soap cell, which is a major issues we are facing in our Australian conditions with the PFAS. And this soap cell product, which is an innovative geosynthetic clay liner products, innovated and invented by Geofabrics here in Australia. So as soon as we are seeing these particular problems and issues faced by the industry here, we are actually bringing some sort of innovations in our manufacturing process and bringing to the market. So soap seal is one of them, utilizing these recycled polymers in our manufacturing process without, uh, I should say, compromising the qualities or performance of the material. That's another one. Uh, we also implemented that one in two years ago. And we are still bringing some more innovations in terms of uh, making a composite products like a geomembrane and geotextile together or laminating different geosynthetic materials together to bring as a one product. And that's what we are doing. So actually we are using this, all the problems and issues and converting into our R&Ds and bringing some new products into the innovative products, I should say, into the market. Thanks, Rajesh. Um, we've had a great question that's come in for you, Elena, from Alexander in New South Wales. And, and I think some of our questions are webinars in themselves. Uh, Elena, Alexander's asking you, are innovations in tunnel design enabling innovations in construction? in particular, increasing the speed that tunnels can be constructed. Um, what's your view? Well, innovation can influence many parts of a tunneling project. I think the speed of construction is only um, part of it. We should probably look at more at the life cycle of the project itself. Um, and they can bring um, efficiencies and automations from the um, design stage where they can reduce manual time um, to, for example, um, platform for stakeholder management, uh, um, uh, helping reducing time to address and getting approvals. Um, there are different aspects of a, uh, of a project where innovations can influence and bring in efficiency um, and also um, optimizations and uh, bring in value for our clients. Um, so overall, um, the design life of a, of a project can be hugely influenced and that would have an impact on the speed as well, but that's just one aspect of it. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Elena. And on that point, we talk a lot about collaboration these days. Um, in that um, um, speed of tunnels being constructed, um, what role do key stakeholders play in that? You mentioned your clients. Well, key stakeholders provide the um, governance and the um, approvals authority. The, um, it's, it's, it's fundamental in, uh, in building a major infrastructure project. And um, it provides, provides the interfacing um, and uh, talking about key risks and uh, uh, stakeholder assets that are around the project. So they, they intervene in many aspects of the design and construction process. So there are just a key stakeholder that it's extremely important in, um, in decision-making and delivering of a project. Thanks very much. And just staying with you, Elena, and coming back to your presentation, we've had a question that's come in from Gert asking, Elena, what's the design option around the tunnel protection zone? What was the design option around the tunnel protection zone? Um, what was the design option around uh, also I want to understand the integration of BIM and GIS. Apologies, Gert, I didn't say your question very well. Okay, so let's let's start. Let's break it down first. Let's start. Let's start around the um, tunnel protection zone. Um, so normally that's um, part of the project specifications. It, it depends um, at planning stage what's been uh, decided what the corridor is. But we specifically talk about obstructions and the way we've. Um, identified clashes um, with, uh, with the tunnel um, alignment, um, that's a risk-based approach. Um, normally the, um, the radius around the tunnel that is adopted to um, run this uh, risk-based approach analysis, um, it's um, 
you um, from past uh, project experience, depending on where you are in the area. Like, uh, for example, um, in um, I think in the project that I've highlighted in my presentation was a, um, a five meter radius around it, uh, and that. It's like a traffic light system that reduces um, basically um, amber, red, and green. Um, so outside a, a, a certain radius, um, there is no risk. And then as we go, as we encroach um, certain, um, the radius, uh, that increases the risk of the foundation um, clashing with um, with the tunnel itself. Um, now, the the way we've uh, looked at uh, foundation types again very uh, dependent on the uh, geography location where you are. Um, so normally in the, in the UK, um, depending on the age and height of the building, um, you are able to determine what type of foundations um, the building has. Um, all buildings normally are on uh, pad foundations, so so very shallow. Um, while newer buildings would have um, would be piled, um, again, depending on how big and how how high the building is, um, and uh, then depending on the geology. Um, of the uh, in the area then you can determine how long those piles um, are going to be and then the risk um, of encountering on obstructions in in your planning phase um, of the tunneling design now the second part of the question uh, was about integration with um, between bim and gis um, so um, and, and, um, when you're planning the planning phase of a tunneling project, um, you will have your um, geological investigation set out that will give you uh, results from borehole logs. Um, and the way we interpret those results is creating a 3D model of the geology and where the tunnel is going to be um, threaded through. Um, and that can integrate um, via digital model uh, with the bin environment. We can, we can then overlay the um, civil structural works, um, which is normally, yes, it is a tunnel, but it normally comes with uh, shafts, stations, depending what the infrastructure um, is designed for. Uh, and we can put the two together, together with the other third party assets, and that becomes our all encompassing um, sole point of truth uh, where all designers um, and, um, and contractors can get information they need for the design and delivery of the project. Thank you, Elena. Thank you for that. Um, Rajesh, you talked in your presentation about Australian manufactured products. Um, Yemi has asked a question, uh, are these materials produced here in Australia or packaged for Australians' use? Um, you may want to answer that. Um, but also, as an Australian manufacturer, you know, what do you broadly see the opportunity and challenges in that? Uh, Rajesh. Some of the products we definitely manufacture here in Australia, uh, which is like medium green, mega flow green. Uh, we also have a lamination facilities here in Australia so that we can actually bring some of the products together as a geocomposite, uh, as well as GCL, geosynthetic clay liners. At the same time, we are also partnered with uh, some well-known, world-renowned other manufacturers like Tensar, Tenkate, McCaffery, uh, Presto Geo Systems, um, you name it, and we have the relationship including Geofabrics Geo UK. So what we do is uh, we offer a full package to our client as a supplier of choice. To, to offer the all the geosynthetic materials requirement on their projects. And that's what our main target is, offering a, a package solutions to our client, covering all the geosynthetic materials demand, and it meets your design criteria or your specification criteria. Now, as I explained, we also offer uh, a research and development facilities or support to our customer uh, through our grid. Now, in terms of uh, barrier or what the current problems we are facing in terms of geosynthetic materials, so definitely, first of all, transportation, shipping is major problems for us. So it just delaying some of the things for us. But at the same time, uh, because of our footprint here in Australia, uh, covering wide range of the warehousing and everything. So we are trying to keep the stock levels and everything as much as we can. Uh, in terms of other things, definitely the quality is paramount. So we 
always suggest and support and assist our customer by making sure that the product we are supplying meets your specifications, long-term design requirement, as well as the durability. And that's what uh, uh, we offer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rajesh. Thank you for that. And just staying with you for a moment, if we put a futuristic lens on this, uh, Rajesh, what sort of trends do you think we're going to see? What are we seeing now? And what do we think we're going to see going into the future? Sure. Um, in, a, in a very nutshell or applications, definitely geosynthetic materials demand will go up. And I can tell you why. The, if you see the material itself is invented in 40 years ago, but in these 40 years, the demand grown up by 400 times. I'm just making some numbers up, but it's huge potential there. Second issue is, or second problem is, definitely as I explained, in a conventional way, if you are doing any tunneling applications or any projects, you go in a conventional way, either you have a big, need a bigger diameter of your tunneling, or you need a higher, like a thicker payment for your drainage applications. These geosynthetic materials can very easily replace on this particular, like 300 millimeter, just one example, 300 millimeter drainage layer, can be replaced with 40 millimeter cuspidated sheet. Fantastic. You need a way, because of your subgrade condition, you might need a thicker payment with say 600, 700 millimeter just to achieve your design loft. Using a geosynthetic materials can allow you to reduce that up to 50%. So that's what. And second and most important criteria you will see here is the scarcity of the good quality fill for certain applications like rock or payment applications, or you name it, or good quality clay. This is actually now, scarcity is already here in Australia. Using geosynthetic materials can replace the huge demand of these particular materials. At the same time, it's also re remove some of the trucks or much machineries running over on these particular roads and having a more issues with the carbon emissions and everything. So if you consider the long-term CO2 emissions and as well as the longevities and everything, geosynthetic materials can offer you a longer design life without compromising with the, any of the performance. At the same time, it's also uh, allow you to reduce the carbon emissions. And there is a very good report actually prepared or done by uh, one of the rail authorities here in Australia. Uh, using some geosynthetic materials in their red applications, and they come up with a very good final numbers of how many trucks they have reduced on the roads, how many CO2 emissions they have reduced uh, without compromising the design life and everything. So yes, uh, in, a, in a simple way, geosynthetic uh, materials is a next stage uh, to grow. Thanks, Rajesh. Um, Elena, do you want to comment on that, the future from from your perspective? Well, what you said is uh, is fantastic. Help us reduce the um, diameter of the tunnel or give us more space um, to, coupled with uh, less carbon emission. That sounds like a um, package deal. Sounds like a good future to look forward to. And as always, we're running out of time like we always do. But, you know, today we've talked about innovative tunnel design and for our young engineers that are coming through, our students out there that are watching and, and our graduates, our new graduates, starting with you, Elena, um, what advice do you give to them? And I'll keep that question deliberately broad. So advice I give is get involved. Um, get involved with the EA, get involved with the um, ATS in the young members cohort, uh, be part of the industry and, and contribute and give back, um, get chartered. Um, it's a uh, it's big commitment, um, and it, but it does help um, a great deal in uh, personal growth and broadening um, your uh, knowledge and understanding of the industry and um, experience. Um, try and get as much varied experience as you can um, from um, design to site um, to contracts, commercial and procurement. Um, just, 
yeah, be curious, learn, and um, and get as much as varied experience as you can. Love that. I love that. Be curious always to our senior engineers out there. Continue to be curious. And Rajesh, if you'd like to comment on that advice for our young engineers uh, coming through, and then we might finish up there. Sure, sure. Um, let me tell you my story first. So when I migrated here in Australia in 2006, uh, as an overseas qualified engineer, I have been given an opportunity to attend one course, uh, one course with uh, one of the institutes here. And the moderator or our actually professor or what I can say for 16 young engineers or migrated engineers here, his first word was telling us, keep learning, all right? You are here to learn. You are here to learn even though I was around 30s, I have a great experience in Australia, in India before migrating here, but still the first answer was, his first question was keep learning. Keep your eyes open, ear open, and keep learning. And I can say this one till today that I'm still learning. And as Elena mentioned, be curious, keep yourself engaged, have a patience to, in, to bring some innovations, have a great patience for the designing sides and bring some innovative designs using some different ideas and and just keep learning. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. What wonderful advice. Keep learning and keep curious. Um, as always, that's all we have time for today. Uh, please join me once again in thanking Elena Gavazi and Rajesh Vazar for their time and input. I'd also like to thank Engineers Australia's industry partner, Geofabrics, for their ongoing support. Um, as always, we're looking for your feedback, so if you could take a couple of minutes to complete the short feedback form, which is linked in the description box below, helps us improve and plan for future sessions. Thank you again for joining us this afternoon. It's been a great session, and we look forward to seeing you at our next Thought Leaders webinar. Thanks a lot, and good afternoon.